from Lawyers, Guns, and Money. This is uh, also going to be about the Game of Thrones episodes, The Climb. Uh, this is actually the second time we've done this podcast because, uh, well... It didn't take the first tried, time. Yeah, they tried to horn in on us, and that's just not cool. So I think we found a way to kick them all out. Um, so, okay, uh, I feel like I'm uh, having a bit of a deja vu, uh, but I'll let you start uh, yeah. again, Stephen. Okay, so um, I mean, the first uh, spoiler topic that I want to bring up is the fact that Gendry is clearly replacing Edric Storm. Uh, for those of you who read the books, Edric Storm is a bastard of Robert Baratheon, um, who during this part of the the book. Stannis is faced with a decision as to whether to sacrifice his nephew in order to, uh, you know, get enough power um, uh, for, for, you know, Melisandre to work a, a great ritual and, um, you know, potentially change his fortunes that way, or to take uh, the harder path that's being advocated by, by Davos. And, you know, I, I like the, the way that they're doing this, the, the use of narrative economy. Um, obviously, it's going to mean more to us that Gendry, a character that we've now known for, you know, a season and a half, is being threatened as opposed to this child that we've just met. Um, the downside is that it kind of interferes with his story later, which is in, in the books... Um, Gendry is knighted by Beric Dondarrion. In fact, all of the Brotherhood are knighted, and that's kind of a nice little subversive moment that's not really covered in the show so far, that, you know, Beric is using knighthood to kind of uh, undermine the class system of Westeros. Um, and he, uh, he ends up working as a blacksmith in an inn that's a hideout of the Brotherhood Without Banners and saves Brienne's life uh, when she's fighting Rorge and Bider. And what I thought didn't quite work about this particular change to the story is that he's so clearly being betrayed in this moment by the Brotherhood that it's kind of unlikely that he would rejoin them after his time in, in, Dragon, uh, in Dragonstone. So I'm a little bit confused as to how they're going to kind of get his story back on track. Why do you assume that he is going to end up back in Dragonstone? They might just take it in a completely different direction, given that Melisandre wasn't even supposed to ever meet Arya up to this point. There's no... We don't really have any assurance that she's going yeah. to... that any of this is going to happen. My my assumption on this, on this point is that, you know, from the, the previews and from interviews with the showrunners, they've talked about divergences from the story as being like detours that because they they sat down with George R. R. Martin and talked about where the story is going to end up they can take these detours because they know where they need to get to um, and as, as long as they end up in the same place they're okay and they've they've already done this like um, uh, Arya serving as cupbearer to Lord Tywin and then fleeing Harrenhal, um, you know, is very different than what than what happened in book two. But it got us to the same place that she needed to be, which is that she arrives with the Brotherhood of uh, without banners and witnesses the duel between the the mountain and, and uh, excuse me between the Hound and Beric Dondarrion. Um, so you know, I I think their ethos is still to try and get back to get back on track eventually. No, that makes sense. Uh, and now, now I can't hear the Brotherhood without banners without thinking of the. Uh, I watched the subtitle version of our previous podcast, which referred to them as uh, the Bros without banter. 
which <laughs> just seems uh, totally inappropriate. Uh, yeah, and if you if you if you want to see some of the uh, the closed captioning from our previous podcast, it's it's in the uh, the comments to it. It's quite entertaining. Um, it does have a certain uh, cadence to it. Yeah, uh, I was going to say there there was another uh, podcast that I was listening to. Uh, I don't know if you've ever listened to it, the uh, Boar's Gore and Swords podcast, which is done by a couple of comedians from San Francisco, and uh, they cracked a joke about the the bros without bo- uh, uh, hold on. bros without borders. That it was like you know if if you need someone to like help you tap a keg or something, then <laughs> bros without borders will help out, which I kind of thought was a charming idea. Ah, uh, beer. Um. The, I guess the other thing I would say is, is in, in a spoiler sense, we, we try to avoid the conversation too much between Melisandre uh, and Arya in terms of what Melisandre actually meant. I don't know if you wanted to talk about that in a little yeah, more sure. depth here. Yeah, let's get into it. So in the books, Arya has never met Melisandre well after this point in the story. Um, so it's interesting that Melisandre very definitively says, we will meet again. Um, I don't know how they're going to do that. It's going to be quite interesting. Um, but, you know, the the bit about her closing, uh, you know, that, that she sees a darkness inside of Arya, well, that fits with their, the sort of the narrative arc of her character, and that there are going to be these eyes that she closes forever is probably a reference to her becoming a faceless man slash woman. Um... I was I was a little bit curious as to whether there's a, a significance to the colors the, of the eyes that she mentions. She mentions brown. Well, that's a very common color, um, so that could be kind of anybody. Uh, green eyes, which could be a reference to the Lannisters because Lannisters have are supposed to have green eyes. Um, and blue eyes, which again that's a fairly common eye color, but it's also in the show. It's and and the book series. It's one that's associated with the White Walkers, that they have these piercing blue eyes. So I was kind of curious as to whether there's a, a significance there. Well, and the other uh, the other eyes that we had, the other eye color that we had that had sort of disappeared from the series are the uh, Danny's eyes, which are supposed to be yes, purple, uh, purple um, but are in fact just blue. Well, um, there's there's a very straightforward reason for that, which is that it... They they actually made up some purple um, contact lenses. They look terrible. Uh, a they look terrible. They don't really. Purple is a hard color, and they just look dark. B um, they were really like painful to wear, and uh, 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 Amelia Clark and um, oh I'm forgetting what was the name of the the actor who played Viserys. Uh, I. Don't remember. Anyway, they both complained that it was like really difficult to act with these things in their eyes. And the third thing is that because so much of acting comes from the eyes, to kind of have this covering um, seemed to detract from their performance and just it looked apparently it really looked strange. Um, so you know, one other thing about the scene that I I thought was a little bit, you know that we should talk about in the spoiler section is that there's the curious fact that we have these two worshippers of the Red God. Thoros is from Mir, which is on the west coast of, of Essos, one of the free cities. Um, and Melisandre is supposed to be from Ashai, which is thousands and thousands of miles to the east. It's basically on the edge of the known world. And you would expect them to have some way of recognizing each other, right, given that they're both evangelists in a foreign country. But yeah. they use a shibboleth, uh, Balar Morgulis, Balar Doheris, which belongs to a different religion. It's the it's the primary kind of precept of the religion of the many faced god of death that's centered in Bravos that Arya is going to become in close contact with. Yeah, when that, she that, that, becomes a faceless man. That struck me as really odd, given that you know even the the, the two episodes that we've had bearing those ties. Ty- titles they were both clearly had nothing to do with the lord of light and and unless it was their way of communicating their own foreignness without letting other people know what their connection is it doesn't make much sense though because everyone there yeah 
I mean, the only, thought, the only thought I had was that it's a phrase in Valyrian that the audience has, has heard before, and that uh, Arya has heard before. So, you know, she has this moment of recognition when they exchange this, uh, that she knows these words have meaning. There's something important um, about them. Um, you know, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense from a theological standpoint, especially yeah. a religion that is as um, uh, militantly evangelical as the, the followers of R'hllor are, given that the, the many-faced god of death is kind of the complete opposite. They believe that, you know, all gods are one god, are the face of, of, of the many-faced god. Um, and, you know, we even saw this with, with Jake and Hagar, uh, where he said, you know, in, um, after Arya had saved him, that, you know, uh, Arya had taken three deaths from the Red God, namely R'hllor, because to a faceless man, uh, R'hllor is simply the aspect of the many-faced God that relates to death by fire, which is not something that either Thoros or Melisandre would, would believe in at all. Yeah, um, so shall we move on to the next bit of spoilers? Sure. So, um, going You're back to... You're much better this, at the segue than I am. Thank you. Um, going back to the the controversial killing of, of Roz by Joffrey, I mean, the, the one thing that I thought might elevate this scene from a kind of uh, women in refrigerators moment is that, um, you know, it could be the case that Mel uh, excuse me, Marjorie and Olena find out about this, and that this is kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of their cost-benefit analysis as to whether it's worth it trying to uh, control this this um, this monarch who seems to be, you know, a complete psychopath, versus just killing him and um, trying to do the same thing with Tommen, who is. You know, in addition to being a sane human being with a sense of conscience, is also a child and is much more pliable. Um, and that would kind of give it some sort of plot uh, plot resonance that that is something more than just pornographic. And and another thing is has we have to sort of factor in: Does Cersei realize that she's broken Joffrey? Like, does she? You know, at this she already knows that she's mm. lost control of him. But, well, she kind of admitted as much last season. Yeah, yeah, but just that she's lost control, yes, but that she created, a, that she broke him, that in her attempt to mold him into this sort of a woman's idea of what a king should be like. Well, not just any woman, but a Lannister woman. Yeah, exactly. Right, that she somehow ruined him. Um, and that this is a mistake she can't make with with Tommen. Um, yeah, I mean, except that at least in the books, she has a really... I mean, this is where the difference between Cersei in the books and Cersei in the show is so confusing. And, and honestly, seeing her going forwards in the show, I, I'm quite... I'm, I'm a little bit at a loss as to, like, how they're going to do this. Because in the books, when Tommen becomes king she is a little bit contemptuous of him for showing ordinary human weakness. And she, you know, kind of almost approvingly says, well, you know, Joffrey would have fought me on this. And Joffrey would have wanted to get his own way in doing these horrible, awful things. And that's what a king should be. You know, a king should be forceful and, and want everything their own way. And Tommen is weak uh, because, you know, he thinks that corpses smell bad. Um, also, the, the sort of the influence of, uh, of the, the, you know, House Tyrrell on Tommen, I think, yeah. is pretty apparent as well. He's, he is not, I mean, he is, technically is Hello? a Lannister, but he's not raised to be a Lannister the way that Joffrey was. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, at one point, Tyrion kind of brings up this thing of, you know, Tommen and Marcella have turned out okay, 
in part because of benign neglect, that Cersei just sort of ignored them and yeah. poured everything she had into Joffrey. Um, speaking of which, um, you know, the one one thing that kind of the imminent death of of Joffrey um, kind of and you know, hey, this is a spoiler section, so if you're shocked, you know, it's your fault. Um, brings up is how the show's going to handle Marjorie's third marriage to Tommen. Because it's already a little bit borderline... Childhood porn. Or yeah, well, porn. I mean, they haven't really gotten pornographic yet between her and Joffrey. But it's already a little bit visually weird to see the two of them as a couple because, you know, uh, Joffrey slash Jack Gleason, the, the actor who plays him, you know, looks like a young teenager. And Natalie Dormer looks like a mature woman, you know, in her 20s. Yeah. And, you know, if if we have her, you know, married to, you know, what should be at this point in the series a six-year-old, it's going to look ridiculous. Um, and I think it's one of the things where they, they may have to age up Tommen uh, in order to just have these scenes be visually credible. Um... You know, and given that we haven't seen Tom in, in uh, let me see, a full season by this point. I mean, he had yeah. like one or two. He had two scenes really where he he said anything in, in season two. No, no, three. I I I'm wrong because he was also in in Blackwater. But you know, he's not been a hugely significant character. And if they just recast him. You know, to to be you know uh, a a more um, a slightly taller and and more mature looking Tommen, I think that might work. It might, but it's still going to be mightily uncomfortable, and it's still going to be in the same way that that Sansa's marriage. Uh, oh yeah. A lot of a lot of my students were disturbed by the fact that uh, the she was going to be married by her first flow. Like yes. that, because, the, you know, in part because my students are of, you know, that age, that they remember that particular moment. And so for them, the thought of being married, you know, at that moment, they... Let alone about, bearing children. Yeah. Um, they found that uncomfortable enough. I can, I can only imagine what's going to happen, um, you know, when we're forced to... Uh, hopefully we won't be forced to do anything. Uh, but when we well, see I mean, them... Tyrion doesn't consummate the marriage, and that's very plot critical. Um, yeah. You know, so there's at least that kind of out for them. Um, but, you know, it is going to be a little bit weird, but I think they can hopefully play it as sort of her and Tommen having this kind of big sister, younger brother relationship. Um, which hopefully makes it a little bit less creepy. But they at least have to be able to stand next to each other without him coming up to her waist. You know, that's just, I feel like visually it's going to look stupid. And that's something the show's actually quite good at doing, making characters who are unequal look equal. We talked a little on the podcast yeah. about the scene with, with Cersei and Tyrion and how they were blocking those shots and the and angles Tyrion. of the shots in, in order to make sure that the two looked as equals. Um, I, I, I have faith that they'll, they'll do fine with that. Yeah. Um, so speaking of, of Cersei, you know, the Tywin's threat to have Loras appointed to the King's Guard instead of married to, to Cersei is kind of interesting because in the book series, Loras does get appointed to the King's Guard because in the series, he is the youngest of three Tyrell brothers. So it's not at all consequential for the survival of the Tyrell name. Uh, for him to be named to the King's Guard, but you know my thinking uh, for how his his storyline is going to go forward, you know especially in season you know four and 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 uh, following on from that, is that it may be that uh, Cersei has Loras appointed to the King's Guard when Tywin dies as a way to duck out of her marriage, um, and that would kind of work in terms of setting up the conflict between Cersei and the Tyrells. That's going to be the political focus of so much of the the King's Landing narrative in the future. 
Um, but, you know, the, the one thing that this episode kind of made me a little bit worried about, given that they transferred the assassination attempt on, on Tyrion from Cersei to, to Joffrey, is that I worry that she's being made overly sympathetic at this point. That, you know, if you look back through season two, uh, you know, she's any, you know, uh, all pretty much all of the, the murders that she's responsible for in the series, in the book series, have been loaded onto Joffrey's shoulders instead to make him even more of a villain. And they've certainly succeeded in making Joffrey completely hated. Um, but what I worry about is that, you know, Cer Cer Cersei hasn't really done anything that bad. And given that she's supposed to switch over into a, a really explicitly villainous, uh, you know, kind of almost out of control mode pretty soon, I worry that that change is going to be too abrupt. I think you're you're underestimating the the extent to which people really hate Cersei. Um, my students hate her with an unbridled passion. They they get no sort of even residual sympathy from Sarah Connor, you know, as the overprotective mother of, of a child she thinks is very important. Uh, but they also don't get, um, I, and I have to explicitly make for them the connection between Robert Baratheon and Bill Clinton, um, Hillary Clinton and Cersei, um, uh, a, a president and or a king lose power because of a, a, a private sex scandal. Um, in other words, the way in which when Martin wrote the novels, you could map Cersei pretty closely onto Hillary and see them both as sympathetic characters doing the best they could with what little power they had. My students get none of that. And, and a lot of that is the fault of the uh, the showrunners now, because the, all of that is present in the book, but it sort of drops out of the, the television show. They just see her as the stock character of something between a, wi a wicked stepmother and a bitch, right? Mm. But they, they hate her with an unbridled passion. They don't, th there's no ambiguity. Um, so I don't think either her turn toward being more manipulative and or her possible well it's not redemption. just more mani it's not just more manipulative it's and there's there's not going to be a redemption for this woman it it's you know the, well, the it's the brakes coming off of the car you know she's right now she's making these kind of you know schemes about who's marrying who and so forth she's about to move into a position where you know, she's in charge of the realm and is destroying the realm and is openly conniving at the murder of family members and, you know, uh, her, her daughter-in-law and, you know, uh, you know uh, going in league with, you know, Westeros' version of Joseph Mengele. I mean, she gets into some really dark places. Yeah. Um, and especially by book five, she's she's in you know full blown psychotic break mode where she's you know she's having auditory and, and visual hallucinations. Um, and I just you know you're going to need to ease into that you know in the same way that you know if if look at what they've done with Arya's character where by this point in the book she's killed a bunch of people, but yeah. in the show she's only killed one person in self defense. I think. In Arya's case, they've got time to kind of build up to that, to the point where that she's going to be credible as an assassin in training in the next couple of seasons. But it's also it's a difference in starting points. I mean, Arya's story began as a young girl, wronged, you know, murdered parents. She was, she was, she her trajectory has always been sympathetic, as compared to Cersei, who, you know, in terms of their desire to play the typical role of a female in Westeros society, both Arya and Cersei have basically said, fuck no. Uh, we don't yeah. want to be. But with Cersei, we get the end product. Whereas with well, Arya, we see the development. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take exception to that a little bit because the, the reality is that while Cersei objects to limitations being placed on her specifically, she never actually makes a break with 
her 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 gender role. Um, as much as she hates women and men too, uh, you know, she she has this immense internalized misogyny and misandry. Um, unlike a lot of other female characters who kind of aren't happy with the the roles that Westerosi society has has put them in, she doesn't come up with any healthy ways of dealing with that. You know, Arya basically escapes, you know, femininity uh, or, or the feminine mystique or the feminine sphere, uh, however you want to call it, by, you know, A, cross-dressing, but also B, ceasing to become a lady, right? She she yeah. steps down in class. Um, and arguably, you know, a similar thing happens with Brienne, where it, you know, which is, we haven't quite seen it yet in the show, but, you know, in choosing to become a knight, Brienne puts herself in serious danger of, you know, murder, rape, etc. Uh, you can take the character of Asha Greyjoy, where, you know, again, this is a, a woman who has stepped out of a woman's role in society, in part because she has a permissive parent like Arya. But, you know, she's always aware of the fact that, you know, her gender is a massive sticking point. Um, and that, again, she puts herself out there in, you know, into a position where she could be threatened. And as much as Cersei might want that freedom, what she's not willing to do is give up being a Lannister, which is what that would mean. Like, if Cersei yeah. had wanted to learn how to fight with a sword, had learned to, had, had wanted to learn... She could have had Jamie teach her. She could have had Jamie teach her, but at the end of the day, what that would have meant was giving up being Cersei Lannister. Like, her father would just have not accepted that. And she would have had a choice to, like, either, okay, I'm going to keep doing this, or I'm going to give it up. And Cersei, at the end of the day, is never going to be able to give up being a Lannister. Because what she wants in the end is not just to be a man, but to be a Lannister man. Um, and that's something that her and her father are just never going to see eye to eye on. And, you know, the... The way I, I, I kind of ultimately get down to this is that there are tons of, of female characters in this series who grapple with the patriarchy as an institution. And most of them find strat survival strategies, adaptation strategies, and critically, you know, their, their, their own suffering, their own oppression becomes... Uh, an impetus for them to look outside themselves and see the injustices foisted upon others. That, you know, Brienne, part of the reason why, as a knight, she is so insistent about, you know, we're not going to kill innocents. We're not going to stand idly by when women are raped. We're going to do something about this. Is because, you know, she's taken her own experiences and, in a Kantian sense, universalized from them. And, you know, the, the characters that we're going to see is sympathetic because of their suffering. Uh, Jamie, eventually Theon, etc. Is because they've all looked outwards from their own suffering. And Cersei doesn't. And, and the, the image that I've always had of her is like she's beating at the bars of her cage until she's bloodied her hands. But at the end of the day, she's perfectly happy to shove every other woman besides her into that cage. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I, as long as she gets what she wants. And I mean, the image you have is, is it's oddly literal, right? Because she will end up beating her hands bloody against the, the walls yeah. of a cage. Um, so, I mean, that, that's, and, but we'll, we'll get to that in a few years. Um, Anything else we wanted to talk to about today uh, while we're free to talk about anything? You had predictions for next week's episode? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, and then I, I, I was thinking I was just not going to give them because I like, I like for y'all to think that we're smart. And if I say that, well, next week is the episode where Arya finally turns into a dragon, um, I have a feeling you might no longer take what I have to say, the criticism I produce well, after the episode. Would you like me to read series. out the, the synopsis? No, no, no. I, I, I like I like cold readings and cold cold viewings okay. of films. So I'm I'm completely uh, the opposite. I believe very much in the uh, scientific studies that have shown that spoilers do not actually decrease people's enjoyment. Oh, I don't think it decreases my enjoyment. I just don't pay as much attention, and ah. I'm 
I'm the kind of person who really needs to sort of focus in on things in order to pick up on slight visual changes. And if I if I already know what's going to happen, I just get a little too plot happy and not really uh, visually attentive. Okay. Well, I think that's I think then we're good for this week. All right. So I uh, hope you've enjoyed our spoiler issues. Spoiler. Spoiler issues. That's. Spoilerific. Spoilerific. Um, uh, addendum to our uh, Game of Thrones podcast on the Quan. And uh, thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you again next week. See you next week. All right. Bye bye.